Okay. We all know that debate is changing, or if you don't know that, then you don't have a, a historical perspective, but since I've been involved in this activity, um, there's been a fairly substantial shift from a, a more traditional debate with counterplans and dissets being the off-case choices to a lot more emphasis on critique debate. And I think that that has been a really positive thing. Um, and basically, I feel as though um, it might be getting to the point where people, however, are losing the ability to effectively argue all of these positions because I'm one of those believers who thinks that it is very possible and beneficial to diversify your argumentative strategies. I don't think that you have to um, necessarily be inconsistent when you advocate a, um, a disadvantage and when you advocate a counterplan and when you advocate a critique. I think that the best option, in fact, the number one thing I hear from judges who don't like critiques is it's one of two things. It's either it's not real world, i.e., you know, it seems like it's too theoretical for them, and they don't know how to apply it, and they feel as though it is a burden of the negative to apply the argument, or there's no alternative. Um, there's no, you know, maybe this is bad, but maybe we can't do anything good. And so basically, I feel that um, the best way to complement a critical argument where you're, you know, basically indicting people's assumptions and interrogating some of their basic frameworks is to advocate something besides rethinking um, or reflecting. Um, you know, my feeling, um, especially when I have discussions with some of my Native American friends, is they're not really down with this idea that all we need to do is just kick back an ivory tower and go, boy, that's really interesting. That basically, you know, indigenous people are resisting in very overt ways and that they want overt support, not just a bunch of intellectuals thinking about these issues. So, in light of that, I'm going to talk about what I think are some of the um, most important disadvantages and counterplans on this particular topic, um, and discuss them, and basically, you know, when I debated, my strength was uh, counterplans and dissets. Um, this is what I was able, I mean, most every judge who you know, the most traditional judges, they vote for these arguments, and most non-traditional judges vote for these arguments. And I felt that sometimes if I was unable to show people how their actions would cause a negative effect, i.e. a disad, or how there was a better way to solve that problem than the plan, i.e. a counterplan, that they didn't respect my ideas. And I take, you know, some of my positions in, that I advocated very seriously. And so I felt that putting them all together was the strongest. Um, I think one of the best ways, if you'd like to come at debate from a very critical perspective, is uh, debate about movements, social change. I think that's one of the, I mean, it was an argument that um, I was very fond of because basically you're not just, you're basically saying, how are things going to change? You're not just saying, hey, pointing fingers, that's a bad way of thinking, that ideology has flaws, but you're really trying to show how. Um, the affirmative plan would stifle so positive social change. Um, there's a lot of great literature which talks about how, for example, federal action will lull and um, movements basically give them a false sense of security, um, that it will decrease their support base, that there are really uh, significant effects of new federal Indian policies, and that um, I feel that it makes your, your critical arguments a lot stronger if you can show how the plan will cause um, the good mindset to fade away, you know? So it's not just, hey, here's a good mindset and you don't have it, but your plan prevents us from getting the good mindset. So I really think on this topic that um, arguments about um, American Indian movements are going to be very, very important, especially if the debate is going to be critical. Um, secondly, if anyone spends a lot of time reading the literature, you can see a lot of discussion about the anti-Indian resentment and anti-Indian violence as a direct res a sort of a consequence of new federal policies. Um, whether you, even if you think that you should never say things like there will be a backlash, you sh you're going to have to answer this to say, and you should at least try to understand what it is that's causing this, this resentment, because 
In our history, we've had a lot. We have steps of progress where we have new policies that are giving more rights to Indians, and there's always people who backlash against that. And I think that that's important because uh, this backlash is not just a bunch of extremists, but actually pervades the mainstream. And a really good example is um, in right around where I live in South Central New York, there's this Cayuga land claim, and if you drive up the road, you see all these you know normal citizens with these big signs and these bumper stickers who are like you know you know treat everyone equally and you know no Indian country. You know all these. This, there's a communities that are just, you know, with people that you probably live next to, and they're, they're sort of getting caught up in this um, backlash where Indians are depicted in very negative ways, based upon a lot of stereotypes such as they're alcoholics, they're making a whole bunch of money from gaming, and so forth. And this is an important part of, you know, if we want there to be uh, progress in terms of the status of Native Americans, we can't ignore the elements of our own white supremacist culture which are going to backlash against them. And I do think that when we think of policies, we have to think about how the people who are against um, the interests of Indians, how they respond to that. Um, you know, this, this is not a popular argument with lots of people, uh, but I, I, I think that it's very naive to ignore what are proven and empirically to be consequences of new policies. Um, it's the same thing with, I mean, I think the biggest implication of the backlash against the civil rights movement is that we haven't really made much progress in civil rights, you know, where we think because we, we pass legislation, but the thing is, is the backlash, it prevents the positive mindset from coming about because they start persuading people about all these negative images about Native Americans, and it prevents the positive change that we're looking for. So I think that an argument that's, is so in essence, it's just a type of a movement which creates negative uh, social relations. Um, obviously, on this topic, you're going to be talking about federalism. And the, you know, this is not a very interesting argument, in my opinion. But there's lots of literature on it. Um, I'll just say this. You know, even though there's going to be people who argue this, uh, I think it's pretty clear that the Constitution gives 100% control to the federal government. Um, you know, I, I really find it difficult to accept that there was ever an intention of giving states um, jurisdiction away from the federal government in regards to Indian law. Um, in fact, I mean, the federal courts again and again, again, to give the example of a Cuba land claim, the state of New York claims to have bought land from the Cayuga in the 17, um, end of the 17th century. And the Cayugas are now claiming that that was not a legitimate sale according to the U.S. federal government. And the U.S. federal government is, yeah, it's like, yeah, we made a treaty with another nation, and that has power over, uh, you know, nations are at a higher level than um, a state. And, you know, when we sign treaties, that is the supreme law of the land. So even though I think a lot of people are going to run federalism because the resolution says federal control, and in my interpretation of the topic I said federal control could be decreasing state control, I think this argument is pretty weak. Um, I just think people are going to run it a lot because there's going to be a link, but you know you are taking away state control, but uh, I don't think that there's much... Like basically, the only there is no uniqueness because we already are violating state rights all over the place with Indian law. Um, and I don't, I don't see any real justification for, you know, I, I have yet to see a justification for the state being in charge. Um, the next one is something I think is a lot more interesting, I've been reading about this all summer, is the debate that's going on inside of Native communities about whether to return to more traditional models of life or to integrate into the dominant culture. Um, you know, unlike what a lot of the uh, more idealistic would like to believe the Native American perspective is very split. You know, like for example, the Arctic National Refuge. You know, there's a lot of people who are like, you know, what a terrible thing, it's going to destroy indigenous culture, you know, it's going to go up there and bring up development. Well, there's a whole bunch of Native American people who really want that. And that's something that we need to learn to understand and accept, is that there are a lot of Native Americans who do want to integrate, who do want to be assimilated at some level. Um, it's not a universal, there isn't a, a universal Native American perspective. But 
obviously there are arguments why either integrated, integrationist perspective or traditionalist perspective is better. And I think that there is good literature that talks about how they're at somewhat of a crossroads in terms of what direction, what, what is going to be the predominant mode of thinking. Um, I think that there's fairly good evidence, and I've seen some links already, to talk about the perception of the U.S. federal government helping, i.e., will, will basically support the cause of the integrationists. Because they'll be able to say, hey, look, the federal government's coming in here to help us and help solve our problems. You know, we can trust that things are changing and we can integrate and sort of be a part of this culture. Um, in many ways, having this perception of the U.S. federal government helping is only going to uh, undermine the traditional, more holistic values. I mean, one of the important things, I think, to understand about, um, you know, the majority of traditional Native American values is that they tended to focus on looking at things holistically rather than in breaking things down and reducing them like our culture or the dominant Western culture does. Um, for example, if you look at, um, I've seen tons of literature saying that we should increase federal control to like stop health problems, stop um, suicides, stop crime waves, but all of these are like reducing it down to here, let's attack it at this one, let's find this one problem and try to solve this one problem and not look at things holistically and how focusing on things individually as separate problems will undermine traditional holistic ways of solving problems. So I think this is going to be a really interesting argument where you can again get it, you can talk about some of these critical issues but you're actually also adding into it causes and effects. And I believe that a lot of people in our culture, i.e. most of your judges, they think in causes and effects, they use very, a very scientific reductionist way of understanding and so you have to find ways of explaining things to them in ways that they understand. Um, it doesn't mean that you have, to not, you have to say things you don't believe, it means you have to try to rearrange the way that you dis, uh, describe the consequences of the plan and why it's a bad thing. Um, one of the biggest, I mean most, a lot of people who don't like critical arguments tend not to understand the implications. Like, what do I get when I vote for the critique? So forth, so on. Um, these types of, dis some of these disadvantages allow you to show what the implications are of voting for the affirmative by showing how it's going to have um, sort of negative side effects once it's applied. Um, another one that I think is interesting is international modeling. I mean, the reality is, as bad as it is in Native America, there is a very strong argument that Native Americans here have it better than any other indigenous people in the world. I mean, they, we, they certainly get a lot more money a lot, they tend to get a lot of their rights protected. We're not at open warfare with them, although if you ask some of the leaders of AIM, they certainly think that um, you know, our, our FBI does have open warfare against them. Um, but there, there is the issue of how other countries are going to emulate our policies and whether or not they're going to emulate it in ways that are beneficial. Uh, when we change our policies about our indigenous population, it tends to encourage other countries to change their policies. And they might change them in a way that might, you know, maybe it works here, but when it's applied elsewhere, it won't work. So the whole issue of how our relationship is copied elsewhere is certainly something that I think uh, is going to be a disadvantage you're going to hear about. I think I've already seen literature for Southeastern Asia, Latin America, Africa, Australia, as places that are sort of looking at the United States to see how we solve our indigenous problem. And I do think that... It, that's the way most people look at it, is the indigenous problem. Um, and so increasing federal control will be uh, a pre sort of a, a model that other countries will copy, and that will be bad. Okay? I don't even want to do this, but... <laughs> the last three disadvantages, you know, they're there, and uh, people are going to run them, and there are links. I mean... You know, you can take, you can take, <laughs> you can take it or not. Um, you know, the whole politics thing, I'm not going to be an advocate for it. I think it's bad for debate. I think it's the worst type of scholarship we do in this activity. Um, I think it encourages people to not read the literature, but to read a bunch of staff writers who know jack about anything. So, I, I don't think that I, I would encourage people to, pursue it, but I think you should at least be aware of what I've seen already in terms of linked stories. Um, new Indian policies will create conflict and partisanship in Congress. 
It'll create emotional, it'll create a lot of emotional, um, you know, just sort of breakdown and people getting really hostile. And so there's going to be people who say bipartisanship is good and you break it up, blah, blah. Um, political capital, Bush is going to have to spend a whole bunch of his resources to pass Indian policy, probably because he's going to have to tame all those conservative people who are going to flip out. Um, so, you know, when, when. Midterm elections, uh, I've seen some good literature that talks about how um, the Native American Indian uh, is starting to take, starting to get much more heavily involved in our political system and starting to lobby. And it's becoming a very powerful lobby, especially in the Southwest, and that it could be a swing vote in these upcoming midterm elections. And I've seen links that say things like a new policy would, in, like if Bush did a new policy, would basically help the Republicans win the next midterm election because there's a lot of swing states that, um, you know, they're going to have people in Congress up for grabs. And okay, now let's go to counter plans. All right, I think. This topic is just begging for counterplans. Um, you don't want to be, I mean, come on. Raise your hand if you want to defend our status quo Indian policy. <laughs> OK. I think that with some judges, it probably makes a lot of sense to argue. If, even, even if you decide, hey, this ads aren't for me. I don't really want to talk about causes and effects. I think, or at least not look at it that way, I think that everyone who runs a critical argument should be running a counterplan. Um, it takes away so many arguments that seem to sway judges. Um, you know, I ha I've just heard it so many times in my debate career, both as a debater and a judge and a coach, is if only you had a counter plan, I would have voted for your critical argument. And you know what? You, if you're going to run a critical argument, it's not only is it like you're going to sway those judges, but it's strategic. If you run counter plans, They'll probably make such stupid offensive arguments against your counterplan that you'll get better links to your critique than you had in the first place. And that's just the, the truth. If you, the more radical your counterplan, the more they're going to start flipping out and start reading everything in their box, and all of a sudden you didn't have a good link, but now you have tech. I mean, <laughs> seriously, if you aren't running a counterplan with critical arguments, I don't know why. I can't think of any disadvantage to saying, I advocate we should do something different. Um, and I've got a couple here. Um, First one is tribal courts have, you know, there's going to be cases that deal with criminal justice and child welfare and so forth where they're going to involve issues. Like I think a really good uh, counter plan against the case you're all running right now is a tribal courts counter plan. You know, don't have them go, don't remove some loopholes that the state currently uses. How about remove the state from the whole process? You know, have tribal courts take care of the problem. Um, I think there's going to be some good literature on that, and then you can just claim to avoid the consequences of, you know, Western bias and, and stereotypes and the Western legal system being bad and all sorts of other stuff along those lines. Um, the next one is exclude, and it shouldn't be BIA his, it should be BIA, BIA slash IHS, the Indian Health Service, not his, you know, typo there. Uh, but basically, you know, these are really evil agencies, and they steal money, and they're very paternalistic and racist and every goddamn bad thing ever, and if the affirmative uses these, then they're screwed. And you can just do the plan and just don't use these agencies. So I think this is something that you want to be um, head on on the affirmative in terms of trying to avoid those types of exclusions. Um, basically, you know, Try, try to minimize how much you have to use these agencies or don't use them at all because it's hard to find good evidence that says they're good. Um, there is stuff, there is recent stuff that I've seen from India Country Today, which tends to be one of the most conservative uh, publications, the weekly newspaper that's uh, put out uh, by the Oneida uh, media. And they're, they're very, very sort of, they're very much integrationists. Um, you know, they also run the casino, which makes a whole, ba whole bunch of money. And so they're pretty supportive of, let's keep everything the way it is. Um, and that's a big thing. You know, the divide between, and I should have put this up here in disadvantages, but I'm going to just talk about it right here. Um, the divide between the haves and the have-nots within the Native American Indian community is really big. 
I mean, this idea that all the Native Americans are getting it the same is not true at all. There are some Native American tribes who are really benefiting immensely. Um, and I think they're, who, who, they're making a lot of money, and so they really don't have much of an interest in changing everything. Um, they kind of like the status quo a lot more than the majority of Native American people who are getting screwed over. But that's disad in and of itself is how does the plan affect inter and intra tribal politics? Um, because that is certainly not, I mean, a lot of us want to sort of have this uh, idealistic, romantic vision of uh, Native tribal politics as sort of perfect and egalitarian and everything. That might very well be true in terms of the past, but it ain't very well true now, and a lot of because of the way that we disrupted, um, especially when the, the, we did our Indian Reorganization Act, where we basically installed tribal governments, and, and it's really messed up and disrupted traditional um, governmental processes. But that is a, definitely a debate that I think that you should uh, investigate. Um, okay, the next counter plan is like, I think, you know, it's kind of like the anti-topic, which is give them back the land, give them complete full sovereign control, and remove all federal control. And we basically, uh, you know, get rid of plenary power, get rid of the trust doctrine, you know, complete, they're their own nation, they're their own people, and that's the only way to, st you can't start thinking about solving any of their problems until they um, are given their full, um, until we fulfill our treaty promises. And anything short of giving them back 30% of America just ain't going to cut it. Um, this is the argument my group's putting out right now. And, um, you know, you can take a look at it when it comes out. But the competition story is very simple. We have evidence that says full, you know, federal control is not compatible with full sovereign control. I mean, this is, no matter what the affirmative does, they're going to have to operate with the assumption that U.S. federal government has any authority. And this counter plan says, no, you don't. You shouldn't have, and the treaties that you signed gave away control, and the only reason that we still think we have control is because we basically backed out when it was no longer convenient for us. Um, there, are gonna, there are advantages of, this is the only way to stop cultural genocide. Cultures are not going to live if they're not allowed to determine their own fate. Uh, cultures that are trapped within another culture that refuses to give them their place are not going to survive. Um, next one is the International Court of Justice, and this is another one where it's about dealing with authority. Uh, and you basically have the United States cede all authority to, to the International Court of Justice. Um, right now, the, in, they had a whole bunch of agreements in Rome where all of the countries in the world basically said we need to have uh, we need to have a court that can try cases and it's not affiliate that basically can make sure that nations aren't you know uh, breaking the law and that there has to be some type of uh, an objective legal analysis from the top and the United States says no I'm sorry but no one can have any control or authority over us. And one of the big proponents of this International Court of Justice is indigenous people who feel that in the current nation-state system they have no representation. And so the only way they can get representation is if there's International Court of Justice which is able to rule that, for example, uh, the United States is, is uh, a defendant right now in the, in, at the International Court of Justice. Of course, we don't show up because we don't recognize the court has any authority. But we have, the Native Americans have, uh, filed a case against the government which says that we are not meeting our obligations under the UN Human Rights Conference um, and that we are basically outlaws who are not fulfilling our treaty obligations that we made and we aren't even providing any defense. We just ignore it. We're just like, sorry, but we don't think you have any... No one's going to tell us what to do because we got the biggest stick. And that's just the way it is. So this is a way of, again, taking away federal control and taking it to another level of jurisdiction. Um, obviously, you can have states do it, but to be entirely honest, as I said before, I just don't see any literature that says states, any good literature that says states should be the ones to take control. Because um, if states take control, then almost always that's a direct trade-off with indigenous control. 
um, and that, you know, in many ways, if you look at it in terms of the three players, the Indian uh, nations uh, almost always are much closer to the federal government. That's why so many want to get federally recognized so they can stop being screwed over by the state. Because if they have federal recognition, then they start they have, you know, equal status with states. Whereas if they don't have federal recognition, they basically have no status. So um, having states do the plan. I know people are going to do this, but I really don't think it makes any strategic sense. Um, the next one is Supreme Court. You know, basically have the court make a ruling or overturn a ruling that changes things and avoids the politics, disadds. Um, also, I think you could argue that um, having the Supreme Court change things would, you know, there would be benefits to that. It would be more long-lasting. It would create precedents, blah, blah, blah. Um, Supreme Court's a possibility, but the reality if on this level is that the Supreme Court has already said over and over again, you, we don't have the, the authority or the jurisdiction to make these decisions. Congress has full plenary power to make decisions about Indian, federal Indian law. All we, I mean, they're really, they have never been given, and nor do they feel it's their responsibility to uh, just determine the fate of Indian law. Um, Lastly, I have executive order, um, and this would be basically have the president order federal agencies to act. And obviously it doesn't have as much um, of an effect, a permanent effect as, say, legislative change, but I think people might argue that an executive order would make agencies change their behavior enough without risking the politics dissents. Um, ultimately, I think when it comes down to it, this topic um, I think a lot of people are going to sort of go with what they know, and I think that stinks. I can see a lot of debates being wasted already with people talking about stuff that we've heard every year over and over and over again. Um, I think there are, you know, I basically put the ones on the bottom, the bottom three of each one, I basically would encourage you not to do those, especially if I'm going to be judging you just because I'll be bored out of my mind, because you'll never teach me anything. You know, I don't want to hear about this crap anymore. You know, if you decide that that's what you're going to run, then so be it. You know, I'll do my best to evaluate it. But the reality is these other, dis these other debates give us a lot more understanding, and I think they'll be a lot more fulfilling um, because they'll force us to read new literature and think about new ideas. And um, I just think that in the end, if you take all your critical ideas and you find ways of applying them, in more practical ways that you'll be you'll be a more uh, effective debater. And I don't just mean effective debater in terms of policy debates at tournaments. I think that you'll be a more effective debater when you have to debate in front of normal people. I mean, the rea I mean, just just face up to the fact. Debate is all about adapting to an audience. You know, you might have one way of thinking it and framing it in your head, but if you're unable to frame it in ways that other people understand, then your voice is going to, you're going to silence yourself and marginalize yourself. You've got to find ways of taking the way you feel and applying it in different situations. And I think that this, that using um, these types of disadvantages and these types of counter plans, this is, I think this is a way that you can communicate with a lot, uh, a lot more diverse uh, audiences than if you just do, for example, what a lot of people in the debate do is they just do sort of the political stuff, but they don't ever deal with the social stuff. And then there's other elements who don't ever want to look at, you know, just want to do everything non-conventionally, then they get really upset when they lose in front of judges who already said that they don't get it. I mean, I think there are ways where you can take whatever philosophy you have and diversify the ways that you explain the argument and the ways that you strategize. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but most people I know who in debate, even if they have really high moral um, motivations in terms of they want to become more conscientious and they want to, you know, understand things and rethink things, um, all those things are, are, you know, very valid, but there aren't very many people who like to do as much work as we do and then lose. Um, and I think there are ways that you can, you know, there's this really bad image, I think, that you can't take 
uh, a disadvantage and a critique and run them consistently together. And I think that there are ways that you can do that. Um, I think there's a, I think there's a, you know, an unfortunate situation where some debaters feel as though they can't argue anything but their critique, and that they they there's also this perception of. I don't like to run counter plans because it somehow increases the, the risks that a, the other team will turn it or something. My experience tells me that um, running counter plans gets them to make bad arguments, running disads gets them to make bad arguments. The more arguments you make, the more bad arguments they make. And, you know, I'll just leave it there, you know. It's just like, anyone want to ask me any questions or do you all just want to go back and get into your groups? All right.